Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Grip Bertman Coaches Cafe. And we're going to have a pretty good discussion today. We hope or continuing our discussion about core beliefs, and we have several people that'll be entering into the dialogue. I hope uh, this won't just be a monologue by any means. As we are going through all these core beliefs and discussing what they mean to us and how they help us to build the community that we know as Grip Bertman. Reminding ourselves that we are not just about the assessments, we're not just about coaching, we really are about community because our mission, our vision, our desire is to build more unity in the body of Christ so more people will know Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. So uh, let me uh, ask uh, Sean Blackston, are you where you could uh, lead us in a word of prayer to get us started this morning? I would love to do that. <clears throat> Lord Jesus, we thank you for your goodness and for your faithfulness. Thank you, Lord, that your mercies are new to us this day and every day. We pray, Lord, that you would guide our thoughts, that you would guide our conversation, uh, that it would be about your kingdom and about you. And we thank you, Lord, for this tool that we have, uh, Grip Berkman, Lord, to help people uh, just uncover and discover how you have fearfully and wonderfully made them and we pray that you would um, equip us, Lord, as users of this tool, that we would be, uh, that we'd be faithful, that we would be diligent, that you would show us those steps we are to take, and we boldly and courageously follow you every single day of our lives. We love and trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank amen. you. Uh, just a reminder, uh, Jay Jarbo is going to be helping to monitor if you want to kick in, and if I don't see your... Uh, raised hand or even if you want to just speak up there are just a few of us online today and so if you want to just speak up don't uh, be afraid to do that what i'd like for us to do this uh, this session is um as we go through the core beliefs uh, you feel free please to make any comments or bring up any issues that you might have had even in your coaching if you say hey on this particular issue i've been having some some problems perhaps or i have a client that maybe has raised some uh, issues about this, feel free to kick that in at any time in the course of the conversation. And then after we've gone through about uh, four or five of these core beliefs, we're going to pause and make sure that we do then say, hey, do we have other issues outside of what we were talking about with these core beliefs? If any of you have any coaching issues you would like to bring up today, anything to do with any of your coaching, particularly with Grip Burton coaching, then we'll entertain those and try to get the wisdom of the group for that. So that'll be pretty much our um, plan for this for this session. Let me uh, direct your attention, if I might, I'm going to share the screen with you um, here. And as we are uh, looking at the, um, can you see that shared screen now? Yes. Okay, good. As we're talking about the, the, the core beliefs, I'm going to advance us to, to look at specifically the statement that we have in our coaches training Christians who are good stewards lead or serve most powerfully through their spiritual gifts. Um, and our, uh, our scriptural foundation for that is primarily in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and looking specifically at verse 4. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working. But in all of them, and in everyone, it is the same God at work. I'm going to take a bit of a risk here. Uh, I am not a Greek scholar. I can use my Strong's Index, and I uh, have my Greek lexicon, and I, uh, I can, you know, look at words and look up individual words to see what the scholars say about them. But there, I, I have heard it at one point in my life where someone was saying, well, this is just Paul repeating the same thing over again. Gifts, service, working, he's just re-emphasizing it because he also says it's the same Lord. But you know what? He says it's the same Lord, it's the same God, but he changes the words that he uses when he's talking about gifts, service, and working. Those are three individual Greek words. Pneumatikos, diakonia, and energema. Uh, and I think that he's talking about uh, three different aspects here. And that's where I'd like to uh, get into a little bit of a discussion with you about this. When we're looking at our 
illustration of the spiritual gifts triangle. The top of the triangle is gifts. Then we come to the left bottom angle, and that is, we, we call it team styles. I would propose to you that that is like the diakonia, the, the serving. How do we serve other people in the body in our team? And the energema, which that means the working out, that is the, the action that's coming out. That's the role that I play then in the body to build up the body of Christ. Uh, that's where my fruit is being most evident in, in, the, um, in the bodybuilding roles. So I would say that, the, that our triangle that we're looking at with the gifts follows this very closely. And, and to me, it, it fits beautifully. I, open it, the mics please, for any kind of discussion you might have about that or anything else you'd like to kick in, any other thought on that. Uh, yeah, Larry, unpack that a little bit as far as the relationship to the three corners of the triangle. Yeah, when we come up to our um, our belief that we serve most powerfully through our spiritual gifts. Uh, I would propose that just having the gift in us is not complete until the, the, until the gift is worked out in some kind of service, in some kind of ministry. As I am serving others, there is where I have evidence of the gift. And you know, we often will talk about passion, um, fruit, joy, those three things as being evidence of the gift that is in us. And so how does that express itself? Uh, it, it's like, uh, you know, it, it, I guess I would say it's like it's dead if we don't have some evidence of the spirit working in us. It's not something we can do ourselves. It is something that the spirit is working through us. So I'm serving others in my team styles, but I am working it out, seeing evidence of it, seeing fruit from it in my bodybuilding roles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Honestly, I've never seen this connected. I must have been asleep somewhere, but <laughs> never connected to 1 Corinthians 12 that clearly. You know, we've talked about, or I've heard us talk about uh, the spiritual gifts, and that could be seen as the supernatural eye. Those are the gifts that God has gifted me with uniquely, and that blend, and it's lived out in the uh, in the supernatural we of team styles. So I bring those gifts into the team, and then the bodybuilding is how I function within the body to for the body to accomplish its purpose. Uh, you know, Tim Rell used to call it the they. It doesn't fit exactly, but it gets that idea of what we do outside of our team to serve others, to bring others to Christ. Uh, that's how that role fits in the body. But honestly, I've never seen it connected here uh, to 1 Corinthians 12, and I like that. It does make sense to me. And if you go back, um, Larry, to the list of Greek words there that flow out of this text, I think it's interesting that we can't make it work without the spirit, and we can't make it work without the whole idea of diakono, uh, diakonia, the, of that uh, serving, pouring ourselves out to be able to serve one another with the energia, the, the energy, the the power that the, the spirit provides. So it's all interwoven with one another. Yeah, I, I agree, Mark. Um, trying to look at them just individually, that, that gets us back to that whole thing of the integrity of the corners, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Definitely. Anybody else have any thoughts or cogitating on that a little bit more? Or any pushback on it? You know, am I am I looking at this? Go back, go back to the slide with the scripture passage on it, if you would. Different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. 
different kinds of service, but the same Lord, different kinds of working, or some people would call that, um, some translations would call that activities. Some would call it ministries, different mm -hmm. ministries in all of them. But in everyone, it's the same God at work. What does that say to you, Wayne? Well, I just, you know, um, one, one of the things I've been working through uh, for not just Grit Berkman, but in the work I do with churches, I, I think there's a large, um, we, 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 we don't get down at the, at the base level why. You know, which is what I love about, you know, Larry, as you started things, you know, the, the Grip Berkman community is about building up greater unity in the church so that we could see more people come to Jesus. I don't think that's exact words. And, you know, there's a, there's a big push in the, in the church world these days on we got to become disciple makers, disciple makers, disciple makers, which is absolutely correct. But the question is why, you know? And it's because their lost people need to find Jesus. And so, you know, I think one of the things that, you know, I'm trying to work with, and I've got multiple clients right now with working with Grip Berkman stuff. It's been kind of a floodgate <laughs> um, in the last couple of months. It, and it's not, we don't, we don't do this just to build the body up or, to, you know, to serve one another. We do this within the church but the purpose the church exists is to serve the world. And, and I think the keeping that why is just so, so important that it, it is, you know, just having these gifts in of myself isn't, isn't going to do anything. And, and just doing them with trying to do them within my body leads towards, you know, just inward, not even healthy growth. You know, it's when, when they're expressed out, outward that we see them become powerful so that's just that was just i was just ruminating on that yeah and when you're saying the why it's not the because causative why but it is the resulting why why do we want to do this so that right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah 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 jay and uh sean uh I'm in the spanish-speaking world um my my Spanish my study of Spanish helped me to understand that much better because you know uh, when I was growing up folks down here in the South would many times say what for when they really meant why <laughs> yeah <laughs> but, but, but the truth of that when I got to Spanish I understood there was a difference in por qué and para qué yeah por qué is is going back to what caused this to happen para qué what for is what result is going to be of it? You know, what am I going to get out of this kind of thing? You know? Yeah. And that, that's kind of what I think you're saying there, Wayne. It's, um, it's, it's that uh, it's not just the why, the causative why, what caused this to happen, but it is the resulting, what's going to be the result of this? What's going to be the benefit of it? And particularly, how am I going to be benefiting the kingdom of God because of this? Or how is he going to use me for his glory? Yeah. And I think the big danger is, is that, um, you know, that, and, and this is a, the tension I think we have to live in, um, is we all, we all, because we are still sinful, selfish human beings, we all tend to serve ourselves well. Mm -hmm. And, and for me, I have to constantly keep it out front that no, we're called to serve the world that, um, that Jesus died for. Yeah, yeah. And I, I just ha I just have to keep that. That just if I don't keep that there, it's real easy for me to lose it. Absolutely. And so that and narrow get my thing that working in us is not. You know, I, I love that because that implies an energy that is in me, and it's not something that I can generate. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts on this particular core belief? <clears throat> Well, and Larry, just to kind of uh, stay on the, uh, the, the, the Spanish-speaking bandwagon there, when, when Shelly and I do a, a team-building workshop, we, yeah, call, hey, Shelly. Uh, yeah. we, we, call, we call ourselves the facilitators of the team-building team workshop, 
And as you know, in Spanish, facilitator, a part of that is facil, which, uh -huh. mean, which means easy. And so our job is to help make this understanding easier access to the people who are trying to discover their gifts, who are trying to discover uh, where they fit in, in, you know, in their local team and then the worldwide body of Christ. And so our role is to, is to, to, to make it easier for them to on-ramp to these, to these things that God has put, put in them. Well, that is great, Sean. Yeah. Okay. I'm signing off because I got exactly what I needed today. Thank you. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> Man. Yeah. Easy yeah. your way. You know, we needed that when our real theme for this all last year with Rip Bartman was easing your way. We, <laughs> oh, but, uh, wow. but as facilitators, and as coaches, you're right, Sean, that that is our role is to ease their way to become more fruitful. Right. Yeah, that's fantastic. Mm. Yeah, I agree, uh, Wayne. So everybody will see you next month. This is enough. To, uh, yeah, that was that was good. Yeah. yeah, but you know what? Let's go ahead and go through a couple more. Okay. <laughs> hey, and Larry, before you move please, on, yes, please. Let me just state the obvious. I mean, it's nothing new or insightful, uh, like Sean gave us. But uh, I just think the core beliefs uh, are so important, and I'm afraid uh, if we just train to the tool, or if somebody just focuses on using the tool. We miss the power of it. That's it. I really believe that uh, Paul Ford and Roger Berkman are, were and are brilliant men, but I, re I really believe that they didn't foresee all of this uh, and how all of this comes together, particularly with the supernatural and the natural. We don't want to be bipolar. We're not creating dualistic uh, worldviews, but how those come together. And uh, I just think that's really important when we're getting deeper into the Berkman is to really make sure that we're crawling, diving into these core beliefs and seeing how they're worked out throughout the whole use of the tool. The tool is a tool, uh, but the God working through the process is his spirit at work. And it just hearing what, you know, how you unpack this and, what Sean and Wayne were talking about, it just made me realize this is really significant. And it took me a long time to get to the core beliefs, actually. Yeah, I, I think that's probably um, common for most, if not all of us, Jay. Uh, you know, we, we were, when we were first introduced to it, we were so enamored with how spot on the reports were to reveal so much to us about ourselves and we were doing so much introspection and learning about ourselves and praising the assessments and that goes for both of them uh, and that we we may have in the beginning at least minimized or forgotten about the whole reason for all of this yeah uh, it is what we're wanting to call to, to draw our community uh, to focus on that if, if this is not resulting in more people coming to know Jesus, then you know, it's just another wonderful workshop that you've been through and put the book up on the shelf and go on to the next one. This ought to be making some difference in the body of Christ, what we are learning about ourselves and how we work together in, in team and in body. Yeah. Yeah, so thanks for, thanks for that word, Jay. Um, absolutely spot on. You know, and... Um, I am um, I am coaching um, a lady who is just joining our community. This is someone who has been a Berkman consultant for several years. She found out about Grit Berkman, wanted to get involved with that, and so we're doing some one-on-one -on -one coaching with her, and she's getting involved in some group activities. Uh, actually, she's going to be joining us in the celebration, in fact, in Dallas because she's gotten so excited about this. But as we were going through these core beliefs, she says, "Oh, this is the best part of all." You know, this is this is so good because um, she's seeing how it is drawing out of Scripture. It's not just us saying, here's a wonderful thing that we thought of. Let's see if we can find a Scripture to go along with this. No, this really is drawing out of our studies of the Scripture. And uh, I think we need to constantly be reminding ourselves of that. So uh, thanks for that reminder, Jay. And keep reminding us of it. It's part of the reason that we do want to go over these core beliefs uh, in these right. sessions.
Good, thanks. So let me uh, run us to another one. You have equipping gifts, supporting gifts, or a combination that God has designed for you to fulfill a unique role in your team and your community of faith. So the questions come, um, is there power in the words, those equipping gifts, or in their actions. And by the way, I don't have the scripture up here, but that is drawing out of 1 Peter 4.10, you know, uh, as we minister according to the gift that has been given to us. If it is a, a gift of the word, then we speak it. And if it is a gift of doing action, then we do it. That's coming right out of 1 Peter 4.10. So as we look at categories of gifts, if you will, or we don't categorize them in the same way perhaps that other gift inventories do, but there is a sense in which we categorize them. Are they equipping primarily for um, uh, building up other people, or are they supporting which would tend to be more toward the gifts of action? So guys, help me to unpack this one here. Guys and lady, Shelly, I include you in that guy's statement. Wait a minute, Sean. They done unmute you. There you go. I said I can be called a guy or you can just say y'all. <laughs> okay, we'll just say y'all. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So any anything you can help me to do to unpack this one? The importance of this principle for me, and it may come out later. I'm checking on my list, but and it may come out later as well. But the importance of this to me is to give people the freedom to be who they are, how they've been gifted by God, and not put unreal expectations on them. Oh, yeah. The big implication there for me is someone who may have all supporting gifts, and but yet we try to push into an upfront verbal leadership role. Uh, in our fellowship with uh, elders, shepherds, uh, we have really good, some really good men that people love and respect, and they're probably the best shepherds behind the scenes of listening, serving, ministering to people. But because we put them into a role of elder, we expect them to do upfront things mm. like other leaders that may be leading in business and may be, you know, able to speak up front and uh, manage a, a meeting. Uh, and so we expect them to use those gifts, but actually we're, we're really limiting them rather mm. than freeing them up to say, L use your supporting gifts. And that may mean uh, and it does mean, in my mind, behind the scenes uh, and service, and that is a leadership role. Uh, we just we have this really weirdness about you know a leader is always up front, and and that's I just don't believe that's right or biblical. So the the three areas here of combo equipping supporting that's one of the most significant implications to me of someone who may have all supporting gifts. Yeah, Jay, um, recently, Wayne, were you about to say something about that? No, go ahead, go ahead. Um, recently, Susan and I were with a, a couple um, as we were looking at their Grit Burtman reports, and they are in a leadership role, uh, shared leadership role with the husband and the wife. Both of them have supporting gifts. And some people would have looked at that and would have said, so what are they doing in this leadership role? But the way they are affecting their right. leadership is by providing the support for other people to be out front. They are alongside or even from behind leaders, but they're from behind pushing other people and saying, what do you need to be effective? Let me be sure you've got there. They're getting all the things together for people. They're anticipating those needs many times. And they are very effective leaders with all supporting gifts. Mm -hmm. yeah. I recently did a, um, a coaching um, with a husband-wife pastoral team whose um, predecessors were her parents. Ooh. 
in the church and the parents retired, they stepped in and she had always worked in the church for her dad and was kind of a co-pastor and associate pastor with her dad. And the husband stepped into the role, um, felt the call of God to, to do it. And so they were, they were kind of like this. And there were all kinds of expectations, I think, being placed more on her than on him. And um, so I remember um, they, they did the, the, the Grip Berkman. They got the results. And the night before, um, I shot our call. I shot them a quick email. Hey, um, I, I know that you got the reports. Here's some things to look at in a preparation for our call tomorrow. And uh, looking, looking forward to it. Um, what do you think? And she emailed back almost instantaneously and said, I know it's only a piece of paper, but finally someone understands me. And just through our conversations the and the freedom and stuff that she began to feel to be more of who she is, uh, which then released him to be more of who he is. And to really begin to work together instead of like this. Yeah. And um, it was, it was ab absolutely huge. I mean, she had such a stinking big smile on her face, um, you know, um, just, and just, just soaked everything in so much, but it was this thing of, you know, allowing, like Jay was saying that to people be who they are, who they're designed to be and not be guilty about it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that is the beauty of this, of course, where we are affirming people in their uniqueness. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's not that one person is more unique than the other. We are all unique. And so we have a unique role to play. And when we can affirm people in that to say your role is important and without you, the body is not complete. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and this has really been affirmed. Well, it was in, a couple of coaching cafes back, but even as I've been prepping for the signature training stuff, the thing that's come out again is that, you know, that one of the nice things about the grip Berkman is that it doesn't buttonhole people. Yeah. In other words, you know, yeah, I know we talk about doer or, you know, talk, whatever. Yeah. But, but it, it's, it's, we are all wonderfully complicated made people <laughs> and and it's not just this this is your this is your buttonhole be in it and and this is you're just buttonhole this is where you are and all you're going to be ever be and and labeled and i think that's one of the empowering things about this is it helps it helps people um really really find a fullness and a, and a freshness of living out life in in ministry Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. One yeah. thing, you know, just like you're saying, Wayne, of it doesn't buttonhole people, but I think it also we have to be careful to help them not buttonhole themselves. In that, you know, they mm -hmm. say, "Oh, I can't be up front because I'm only support." You know, I'm only powerful in support. You know, I we one thing we like to remind them continually when we're doing an individual coaching as well as a, a team building time is to help recognize we have the gift of the Holy Spirit. It is the gift of the Holy Spirit. And he manifests himself. He works powerfully in our lives in different ways and most powerfully at certain times. But there are times we may have to rely on the Spirit, which wouldn't that be daily, but we rely on the spirit to do something maybe we are not comfortable with. And, you know, I think just like in our humanness, we, we want to put ourselves in boxes. I think we, we are comfortable if we can find a box that we belong in. Um, but it's not God's plan for us to get comfortable ever. And so he's not going to allow us to be in boxes. So I think we have to um, not only recognize that, but communicate that too, that even though, you know, this is where we see you on the, the, you know, on the grip, we also have to help keep reminding them, 
you know, don't take a picture of this and put it on your wall and only stick to these results. Well taken, Thank Shelley. Uh, in fact, that that goes along with uh, with the next core belief. Oh, well, I, I love to do segues. <laughs> you segue perfectly <laughs> in that because the gift blend and this does all you know tie together the, the, with that gift blending of their spiritual gift combination is the other thing of looking and saying, hey, you're not just an exhorter, you're not just a prophet, you're not just a pastor, uh, or you're not just service or helps. Uh, you know, we get all that, what your combination is together, and that again makes you unique. Uh, and even two people that might have the top, same top four gifts, maybe even in the same order, they are still unique from each other in the way those things play out in their lives. Uh, so we don't get, get to buttonhole or pigeonhole people or put them in slots or categories. Um, we have to recognize each individual as the unique individual that God has made them. And while doesn't this speak to the, to the enormous creativity of our God, that even though we might look very similar to each other, even though they might be identical twins, they still get to be individuals. I don't know about you, but that just blows me away to think about how creative God is in this, and we see evidence of it as we see the working out of the gifts in each other. Uh, the other thing that you all have mentioned that we really need to emphasize here too is the importance of affirming people in those gifts. With every Grip Bertman meeting that we have, with every um, team build that we do, that time of affirmation is probably the most important time that we spend in the entire workshop that we might be participating in. That's where everything finally really comes together, don't you think? Yeah, Larry, I think that's one of the values that I, I always share with others. Mark Brazel has heard me say this before, but anytime I get together with anybody from the Grip Berkman community for any significant amount of time, we're going to have that affirmation time yeah. and I, it's just part of who we are. Uh, and I still remember working with a group in Rwanda uh, and I was talking about affirmation and one of the leaders just raised his hands and we don't do that here in Rwanda. And I mm -hmm. said, okay, tell me, tell me about that. <laughs> he said, well, if Rwanda, if you, if a boss affirms a subordinate, uh, then they're going to think that they've arrived, that they are permanently in the good favor of their boss, and they're going to quit being motivated and work. Uh, so I didn't argue with them. I just went about the training, and we had their, had their profiles up and uh, got them to speak to one another, and you could just see them light up. And so when I brought them back, uh, I said, now, after being affirmed, did how do you feel? Uh, do you feel motivated? Do you feel that you've arrived? You know, I didn't, I didn't make it blatantly obvious. Uh, didn't want to embarrass them, but uh, they were like, no, I'm motivated to do more. And it's just such an empowering uh, practice that needs to be embedded, I think, into all teams. Martin, you wanted to add something to that? Well, I think it's interesting in, in thinking about affirmation, permeating the the as a core principle as as most important here it's it's got to bleed over into every day of our lives and so every opportunity we have to affirm people and to see bring out the good in them um, that that's a part of who we are really good point there mark um, how many times have you been in a team build situation with people and you've done the affirmation time and you see people crying and they say, this is the first time anyone has ever done anything like this for me? That's, that's exactly right. I think, it's, I think it's so important. And how can we communicate to the team, hey, you need to find a way to keep doing this. <laughs> you know, so keep true. Another up. And not to the point that it's <clears throat> mundane or routine, but that it is genuine whenever you can see the strength in someone else to affirm that strength. And even, you know, we, we are setting them up perfectly for do this when we talk about the I need parts 
uh, you know, here is what I need. And by the way, you have that strength and I need that. I need you. You know, if we can get them to use that uh, direct personal second person language, I need you, Mark, because mm -hmm. you have something here that I don't have. So how do we get you know, teams to, to continue that dialogue in that way? Wayne, do you have something else you wanted to add to that? Um, well, I was not to that. I was going to back up a little bit and look at the, the uh, idea of the gift blending, the melding together of your spiritual gift combination. And um, I don't remember her name now. I'm sorry. Um, uh, Shelly? Shelly. I had, it, I had the S right. Um, you know, talking about the gifts and, you know, I can, my, my gift combination has been as I, you know, done and I maybe need to redo the, the, um, the Berkman for the training coming up, but, um, you know, it's been pretty much the same, the same blending and melding, um, together. And, um, maybe that happens as, you know, you mature. But I do remember a time in ministry where um, in the leadership role I had as pastor of a small church that was really wanting to evangelize that, that I really felt like for a period of year, several years, you know, I had, I had a strong gift of evangelism and um, didn't really, never really had it much before that and, and not really after that. But during that period of time, um, and I, I think that was essential to seeing the church reclaim their founding vision and move out into the community that they, that they were uh, planted and called to reach. Um, and so since that time though, it, it's, it's, you know, I've pretty well been this and, and I'm wondering, you know, um, and I don't know if there's been any research done. This is maybe chasing a rabbit trail. If you don't want to go there, Larry, we could talk some other time about it, but you know, as, as, a, as a Christian, matures and has been a believer for more years and has put their gifts to work. Um, do we find that there is kind of this, not just melding, but welding together? And, and part of the reason I wonder that I do a lot of leadership development um, um, based on some study work by a guy named uh, Robert Clinton out of Fuller that talks about, um, you know, my, a major role, you know, ultimate contribution and things. And, and how, how does this gift blending um, affect that major role? And I know the Berkman and all that, we don't talk about skills, uh, but that's definitely part of that major role stuff. But how do we help people, you know, take that step of really understanding as they're in their 40s and 50s, begin to really understand major role and contribution um, to, the, to the body? And, and how, does, how does this the grip Berkman, how does that help facilitate that and, and, and help that, help that along? And that's probably a big question and something for some other time, but, um, um, a couple of you guys shook your head and understood, been probably read some of, or been around the Clinton stuff. Um, mm -hmm. some, um, the organization I previously was with was big Clintonites, um, as far as our leadership stuff. Oh, yeah. Um, so anyway, it, it, that's one of the things that um, I'm trying to work with a group of pastors now on really understanding as they're in their 40s and 50s um, and even older of understanding, you know, major role in things and which is so important to them having enough um, personal fulfillment in their um, personal fulfillment as they pastor so that they will stay long term in that particular situation. In other words, you know, if if I'm, you know, if I have maximized what I feel is my contribution in this place, and a lot of times I'll move to another <laughs> church. So how can how can I take my my major role, this melding, and help mature it and develop it and expand it even beyond, you know, what I've been buttonholed in as pastor, so to speak. Does that, does that make any sense at all? And Jay I'm, says, I'm wondering. Jay says it's making sense to him. <laughs> yeah. Are you wondering, Wayne? Yeah. So I, I just, you know, how how can, um, you know, as we as we coach people with the with the grip part of things, really help people begin to formulate and understand. And I think that has to do with this melding together and the combination, yeah. and really helping them understand 
this is this is kind of who God's not just melded you together, but He's welding you together to be. And this is kind of a major role in how you can contribute not to just this local body, but to the larger body. Yeah, I don't know of any studies that have been done, Wayne, about that. You had mentioned that, but I really have benefited from Clinton's material and the the stages of mm -hmm. leadership. And I think mm -hmm. probably gifts come in at different times mm -hmm. upon those stages. Uh, and so I don't know any research, but I, I do appreciate what you're saying. And I think the gift blending helps to say, well, let me back up one thing. I was going to say earlier, I like the gift blending because when I was trained in spiritual gifts before I got to the leadership grip, they would always talk about primary, secondary, and tertiary gifts. And that's where I first learned the word tertiary, what that meant. Yeah. Uh, and, but that was, that. Yeah. 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 We didn't go farther than that. And that, that was too rigid for me as mm -hmm. far as, okay, now I'm using my primary gifts. Now I'm laying it aside. But the idea of how am I leading using my pastoral gift? Mm -hmm. How am I leading from my wisdom gift and, and vice versa? And I do think there's a connection from what you're talking about as we understand the gift blend and how, is even as Shelley said, how some uh, gifts that may not be on our radar may arise at certain times. If mm -hmm. God is going to provide for his body every gift needed at the time, uh, and somebody doesn't have that on their top four or top three, mm -hmm. you know, it makes sense, spiritually yeah. it makes sense for it to come in. So I don't know what that means, but I think that makes me think, I want to help people go deeper than then just the top four, top three. Uh, and the gift blending has helped me uh, to understand, you know, to help them understand the flow of that. And, and they have to figure that out. And it's not, it's not just isolated into quadrants. It's, it's a flow of the spirit of God at work in you. Yeah. Yeah, I, I still like Paul Ford's word he used, the, the mushing. The mushing, yeah. sure. <laughs> yeah, the mushing, the technical word there. But yeah, yep. it, and, it, and it helps people be able then, the, the mushing or the melding, um, and I try to help people, um, you know, name it. So when you take these top four, you know, what, what is one or two words or three words that would describe what's going on when you're, when you're engaged in that completely? And it gets – and then it helps them. It helps them understand. Okay, this is this is an area where I need to I need to be at more often, and and engage in more often, so that God can work powerfully in me. Yeah, Wayne. Um, I, I think some of what you're talking about too is just stage of life. You know, and when we do look at the studies, you know, that or, or or at least the narratives that people have written about stages of life and how we begin to see our roles changing somewhat as we age and you know one of one of the writers called that you know when you're coming into your 40s your 50s you know being in that warrior stage um well but you know you're also learning what battles you want to fight and which ones you don't and i think some of that has to do with our recognizing our giftedness too you know where am i expending my energies uh, and you start to define your you know the next season of life you know what do i expect to get out of this what am i going to be contributing and so as we help them to learn more about their personality and their gifts and this blending of their gifts what's your gift combination it can help them to get some definition on that uh, as they perhaps you know I <coughs> come to this what we call midlife crisis i guess you know am i really doing what i ought to be doing and i where i ought to be Am I going to be stuck here for the rest of my career, whatever? Man, we can give them some really good coaching to discover, wait a minute, let's see where God is using you most powerfully and how can you maximize on that? Um, I, have, uh, I have done a couple of retreats with guys now who are at that stage where we take a group of guys together and we go through their grip Berkman and we help them to, to work through this thing of being bummed up, beaten down, 
burned out or just plain bored and uh, helping them to kind of work through this together as they're, as they're getting a new lease on life, if you will, and helping them to discover that gift blending in them is a, is a huge thing <clears throat> to help them get more focused in this next season of life. Anybody else have anything else you wanted to add to that? Well, I'm going to I'm going to pause our core beliefs discussion at this point because for the next couple of minutes if there are any special things that any of you might want to bring up that you have uh, encountered any challenges in your grip Bertman or other coaching that you'd like to share with folks, we'd like for you to bring those up at this point. I want to be sure and give some time for that. Is anybody Having any of those, Wayne, in a way, you kind of mentioned one with those guys you're working with there. Um, you mean the, the group of pastors? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's, it's um, you know, really being able just to help, help them really understand, you know, so many guys, in, in, you know, and I've, I've been through this, um, you know, when, and it is these stages of development. It is life stage. But how to how to move into that 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 major role in a healthy way, uh-huh. and and not experience you know not experience burnout, right. and um, and and not experience checking out you know just you know a lot of pastors are just you know when you get fifties and sixties it's that's not about finishing well it's just about getting out of here, <laughs> and being alive, and um, you know so how how do we how do we finish well. Um, one of the things that would be interesting um, conversation is um, doing, you know, how to do a, a one day, and I, this is not for now, but maybe an, another coach's cafe, but with, with the new um, signature report, um, it, it, it's just changed everything with, with what I do with, with clients and with teams. Um, but how to, you know, kind of what's the, what's the outline of a one day team build, you know, like an introductory team build. And I've taken stuff from Larry and from Tim and from different ones, you know, and I've kind of built something. Um, and, um, you know, what I found, I did my first team build with the signature report and with the old report, it would have been a good eight to nine hour day, solid, hard day, just cause you got to interpret the report with the old report so much. And with the signature report, it was like six hours. We were like, Hey, this is good. <laughs> it was, it was different. It was easier. So what is it? What does a team build look like? Uh, would be a, would be a healthy converse. I think a helpful conversation for me yeah. um, to have. Um, I can tell you what I'm doing right now with a couple of teams that I'm working with. Um, <clears throat> The first thing I like to do is sit down with the leader and I want to hear what's he wanting to accomplish with this. Mm -hmm. I, I, I like to have a one-on-one -on -one at least with the team leader. Uh, I'd like to have a one-on-one -on -one with everybody before we go into the team build session. And sometimes for whatever reasons that just doesn't work out. You know, I offer it and people with their busy schedules, will postpone it until it's just too late or whatever. So, but I, I insist on the leader letting me have one-on-one -on -one with them before we come to the team build. And I want to hear from that team leader, what is his or her uh, goal here? What, you know, what are they wanting to accomplish? What are they seeing that this can do to benefit them? And then I want to try as best as I can to make sure that the team build is focusing on some things that are going to help them in that regard. Now, I could be following the same pattern almost every time, but I just want to make sure that it's going to, right. that, it's, that it is going to address those needs. Then there are certain things that I always am going to include in a team build. I'm always going to want to include the four exercise with the Burton map. And I'm always going to want to include a similar kind of exercise sitting around in a group with the uh, team styles and the bodybuilding roles. Those are three things that I'm always going to get in. I am Almost always, there have been one or two times that I have not used the posters, but almost every time I want to get them to create their posters so they can share with everyone else. And <clears throat> lately, what I have been doing is making sure that the last thing that we do before affirmation is the presentation of their posters. In fact, the last few times I've been incorporating affirmation with the poster sharing time. 
So here is a final, introduce yourself to the group using your poster to share your gifts, your personality, what, you know, a statement of your strengths. And the last thing I want them to do in their introduction is tell us in a brief one or two statements where you see your strengths. And that needs to take into account your giftedness and your personality. Uh, so share with us what are your strengths and share with us what do you need from the group for you to be in your most effective self in, in your ministry with this team. And then as soon as they've done that, have the group affirm the individual. So we make that the affirmation and the presentation of the posters, uh, we, we do it together. And it has been very powerful to see how as the person is presenting themselves and they're getting kind of excited, you know, to say, I'm discovering these strengths and this is what I need from the group. And the group then affirms them and says, yes, we affirm that strength in you. And by the way, yes, we will do what we can to help see that those needs are met for you to be in your most effective self. And, you know, according to the time we've got, um, filling it up from there, I'm discovering that a one day team build um, is about all I can get. I would love to get two, two days out of teams, but it's kind of rare now to get a two day retreat type setting. It would be fantastic if we could. And once in a while we can, but it's pretty rare. Most of the time it's a one day team build like we're talking about. So what are some other things that you guys uh, would want to include others of you? Y'all, Shelly, that you want to include in a team build? Yeah, I would, uh, I would affirm that, um, you know, what we have, uh, what we have learned from, from you and Susan, what we learned from Paul Ford, what we've learned from Steve Hoke and, and Larry and Kay Martin and others who have been our mentors, our guides, Kay and Andy, oh, Kay and Andy, Sam, uh, yeah. you know, that, that, that really, you know, I, I see a lot of consistency in that, um, we have been and continue to do a lot of these things because we see it being effective. We see it bringing the results that we hope out of the, out of the, you know, the whole process. Mm -hmm. And know. the things you said, Larry, are kind of the things we see as the, you know, must have in a, in a time with people. And, you know, to kind of, I do like what you're saying about, you know, talking with the leader, um, and it'd be great every individual, but if, if a leader's asking us to come in and do a team build, then we kind of want to know more probably what his hopeful goals are versus every person. Oh, I hope, you know, that I can have coffee more often with my boss. Um, so we, you know, but asking that question, I think is really helpful. Um, so that we are designing and we are, you know, pulling out, um, from the from the assessment as well and the instrument as well as you know how we guide conversation and get people communicating to you know hopefully then reach that desired goal within eight to ten hours you know with a group of people. Yeah. Has anyone ever taken a group of thirty people through it at the same time? Forty. Yeah. Yeah. I have thirty-five is the most I've had. Or 40 to 50. Uh, we, yeah. close to 50. Last year in Israel, we did the entire Jewish cluster with our mission. And uh, it, was, it was too big. It was, it was somewhere around 45 people that went through. But, uh, but we did have two and a half days. We did have two and a half days. So. And we did a lot of, we would convene for some teaching. And then we would split them up into their teams and, and smaller clusters to do the posters, to do the affirmations, to do a lot of the, the exercises and stuff. So it worked, but it wasn't, it wasn't ideal, but it was our only, it was our only option. Yeah. Okay. I'm and in October. I'm, I've been working with the church staff, the, the pastor, executive pastor and three staff members for a year and a half, two years. And now they've had so much success with it, really helping them build their team. They have a, a, a early childhood education center and they're, they want me to come and do a team build with, with their whole staff of that. And so. Wayne, I've done that. In fact, I'm coming, uh, Jay, we're coming over to Fort Worth in September and gonna be doing one with some folks from our tribe from Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, 
and they're going to have 36 people in that one. But I would never do one that large by myself. I'll just tell you, I would always bring in some help for that, um, at least two or three people, so we can do some subdividing. And what we have done when we've done, for example, the poster sharing, we haven't done the poster sharing with the whole group. We've divided them into groups, no more of six or eight, and let them share in those smaller groups that they work most closely with. We say, hey, you may call this a team of 36, but you're not really a team of 36. <laughs> right. No, no team at that size is really working as a team. Uh, you've got some sub teams, clusters, whatever that you might call it, people that live more uh, closer together or people that have uh, jobs that are more closely aligned, whatever. So find some way to divide them up and do that poster sharing with smaller groups. And we did a whole lot more things around the table, discussions around the table, and not just um, talking out to the group. And so having two or three facilitators that can work and run the tables to you know, drop in on their conversations a little bit and participate in that um, is helpful. Uh, doing a whole lot of activities though by smaller groups in the larger group. And then you've got the real problem of what do you do if you are gonna do that floor exercise. Um, but we, you know how like uh, last year at the celebration, how we had stations that we worked around simultaneously and one group goes to this one and one group goes to the other one. If you've got three or four facilitators that can be there, um, or even one person who can be the leader facilitator going around to each of the stations, even if they're not a trained coach, they can at least be briefed on how to do this exercise and um, dividing them up into those kinds of groups. So you can get to that floor exercise, which is really important. Um, they, a large group like that, it's really hard to figure out how to do that floor exercise. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you got now, I, I wasn't I wasn't at the celebration last year, oh, okay. and so I, I if if I had a description, I do have the pastor you'll see, and a, you'll see something similar to that uh, in in a in couple, a, weeks. couple weeks. Okay, yeah. um, the the pastor and executive pastor uh, they've we I've been working with them between three and four years with Rip Berkman stuff, and in fact I'm trying to talk the executive pastor to coming to the coaches training, hmm. um, and. Um, this might help push her there. Um, yeah, it'd be great. So they're, they're pretty um, knowledgeable as far as working with it. Um, so I'm, I'm going to be able to depend upon them a lot for it. So but yeah, but having the some stations or something, I'm kind of visualizing a lot of different things, but yeah, any help, any, I, I would take any suggestions I could get. Jay, any final comments? Yeah, Shelly. A question that I had on kind of when I hear about different um, team builds and things that y'all do, um, one question that comes to my mind, do y'all make sure that you do a an individual coaching before a team build with every per participant at that team build? We like to, we try to. Um, as I say, there are some times that it just doesn't work out for some people, but we try our best now to do a coaching with everybody before they come to the team build. I used to not do that. And then I realized we were spending way too much time teaching. My, my, um, my justification for that in the past was, hey, we've got so much stuff we need to tell everybody that's the same stuff about how to read their reports and all that. Let's just do all that together at the team build. But I came to realize that was cutting down on the time we could actually be doing the team build. We were having to spend too much time teaching about it. And so we found that, no, it is better if we can have a one-on-one. -on -one. Now, the good news is the signature report is so self-explanatory now that, you know, I don't feel it is as critical now as it was in the past. Okay. Um, but it surely does help to speed things along if we can have that one-on-one -on -one with everybody before they get to the team. Yeah, and, and I found that to be really true with the old report. Yeah. Um, and now with the new report, um, I, I'm wanting to shift towards a, a follow-up with each individual. Yeah. Um, because, you know, people are reading this new signature report and doing that, I think it's page 31, the exercise of fill in the blank stuff. What are you going to do with this thing? Right. And the insights, yeah, the insights and stuff they get off of that, that they're bringing to that before we even talk about the, you know, anything is incredible. So I've moved towards rather than trying to do one before, try to do a follow up after. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great idea. Anything else you would add? Uh, 
No, a nod to that. I, I think the team build experience this group has is really important to share with others. So I'm thinking a little bit selfishly here of newsletter. So particularly for Shelly, Sean, Wayne, uh, Mark, uh, if you have any uh, uh, example schedules for a uh, one day, half a day, two day, and if you would like to put together kind of a, here's a brief introduction. So I'd love to have that information for the newsletter. We try to keep our base articles to uh, 500 words to have it brief, but we can also add handouts. Like you could, you know, focus on an aspect of your team build or a, a, a schedule of it, and then we could add the schedules and other supporting material to it. So I'll send you an email to remind you of that, but I'd love, I know it's extra time, you're busy, but uh, you could probably take from what you have, and that would be very beneficial for the community. Yeah. One, one other quick word and then I, um, is one of the things I didn't do with the first several team builds, but I've started doing is really building in, and I don't spend a long time there, but really get into these core beliefs because that they, they really do set the stage for understanding and applying, um, you know, their individual and then team and, and everything. Um, so, you know, I spend, I spend a period of time really walking through the core beliefs um, because that does produce kind of, it sets the stage. It's the foundation for applying what they're going to apply. Um, so that's one of the things I've, I've put in over the last two or three team builds um, and was very helpful. Um, you know, I always want to get to the, let's get to the report, let's get to the stuff, but let's, I found it, if you lay the foundation, again, especially with the new signature report and all, if you lay the foundation, then people begin to see it uh, right. naturally. Mm, yeah, excellent. Um, I was just looking back in our Grip Bertman resources page to see, we, we used to have a couple of um, outlines for one, two, or three day team builds. Mm -hmm. I think those have been pulled because we needed to update them to the new reports to, to match the new reports and we don't have that right now so that's something jay as you're getting these folks can give some contributions that will get them posted on the new website with the resources page to share with folks. yeah yeah john took those out and i think we're waiting for the new website to repopulate all of that right so um but we can share um among ourselves that way and jay it'll be great to have people contribute to that yeah well guys uh we have passed the hour uh, in our discussion here. Uh, thanks to all of you for participating in it. I don't know about you, but I've been taking some notes of good things. I always get things that I learned from this. Uh, selfishly, we'll keep this going for me, if no other reason. <laughs> Jay, we, Jay, we always benefit from it. Uh, mm -hmm. Thanks so much for your participation. Want to remind you about the celebration. It is coming up. Keep watching your newsletters for details, and please go ahead and register for that uh, soon so that we can make plans for your attendance there. It's gonna be a great time. Uh, we're gonna have some new folks with us that will be there and some old folks that will be there and some in-between folks. Uh, it's just a great time to be celebrating together as we build community in the Grit Berkman community. So um, folks, thanks again for your participation. It's good to see you. And we just wanna remind everybody to keep on doing everything you can to build unity in the body of Christ so more people will know Jesus. God bless you all, we'll see you next month. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, Thank you folks.